government procurement, services and investment, subsidies and countervailing duty, and dumping and anti-dumping duties. Uh, I'd like to describe a bit of uh, information that will be help for the private sector. The NAFTA office at the U.S. Department of Commerce has developed a NAFTA fax, fax information service that can be reached on area code 202-482-4464. They have also prepared the NAFTA implementation resource guide, a copy of which has been provided to your site coordinator. This guide offers addresses and telephone numbers of sources of NAFTA information. In addition, the Canadian Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade and the Mexican Ministry of Co Commerce and Industrial Development, called SECOFI, have developed a number of publications describing the benefits of the NAFTA and how businesses can take advantage of the reduced barriers to trade. Uh, I would like to now turn to conflict management and dispute resolution under the NAFTA. I manage the NAFTA Secretariat, which is a unique organization created to manage dispute settlement procedures under NAFTA, consisting of mere image offices in Washington, Ottawa, and Mexico City. The three Secretariat sections work together to administer panel review procedures under Chapters 19 and 20 of the NAFTA. The Secretariat provides administrative support to panels and maintains a file system for all case documents, functioning much like the clerk of the court in judicial proceedings. It has no substantive role in panel deliberations or in the outcome of decisions. The Secretariat may also be called upon by the Free Trade Commission to support the work of all other NAFTA committees or groups. In any major trade agreement, it is necessary to provide mechanisms to manage disagreements among the participating governments. NAFTA provides a highly sophisticated system aimed at resolving disputes at the lowest possible level of government so that trade relations can proceed smoothly and efficiently. NAFTA Chapter 20 applies to all disputes between the NAFTA governments who are called the parties to the agreement regarding the interpretation or application of the NAFTA. The real action under Chapter 20 is in the consultation process. In order to ensure that the NAFTA governments grapple with all issues that are causes of concern, any problem can be raised by the staff of the U.S. Trade Representative called USTR, SECOFI, or the Canadian Department of International Trade in the context of NAFTA. By raising problems at the staff level, each agency can call on the private sector, other governmental, governmental agencies, and any other interested person or organization to provide relevant information and to assist in the resolution of the problem. This has resulted in very few disputes reaching formal dispute settlement under either the NAFTA or its predecessor agreement, the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement, which I will refer to again as the FTA. When disputes cannot be resolved by consultations at the staff level, they are escalated to the Free Trade Commission. This is the part of the binational panel process. The steps in this process are outlined on pages 90 and 91 of your participant manual. There are strict deadlines for the Commission to deal with such disputes, and if no agreement can be reached, a binational panel may be called upon to render an advisory opinion to help the government settle the matter. The, the parties maintain a roster of up to 30 people who are willing and able to serve as panelists. The roster members must have relevant expertise or experience and be independent of any government. The panel always comprises five members who are selected by means of reverse panel selection. The governments agree upon the terms of reference and a timetable for the conduct of the panel review. The parties normally follow the deadlines established in Chapter 20 and the procedures outlined in the model rules of procedure for Chapter 20 panels, which will provide for written submissions, oral argument, an initial report, comments by the parties, and a final report, all normally within 120 days of the formation of the panel. 
When the panel issues its final report, the disputing parties shall agree on the resolution of the dispute in conformity with the panel determinations and recommendations. Whenever possible, the resolution shall be non-implementation or removal of measures determined to be not conforming with the NAFTA or, if this is not possible, compensation to the complaining party. The parties have 30 days after the issuance of a final report by the panel to reach agreement on a resolution of the dispute. If no agreement is reached, a complaining government may suspend the application of benefits of equivalent effect until an agreement is concluded. Five disputes reach the stage of binational panel review under the FTA uh, between the U.S. and Canada involving fish and agricultural products. Only one Chapter 20 panel has been convened under NAFTA, including or involving tariff rate quotes on Canadian dairy, poultry, eggs, and other agricultural products. I would now like to transition from the dis general dispute resolution under Chapter 20 of the NAFTA into the much more specific um, uh, area of Chapter 19 dispute settlement. Uh, one of the fundamental issues that the Canadian and U.S. governments confronted in negotiating the FTA, that's the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement, was how they would handle government subsidies and dumping by private companies in the new free trade area. This set of issues was so fundamental that the Canadian negotiators walked out of the trade talks with only one week remaining to negotiate the final agreement and this after more than two years of negotiations. You can find more details on this stalemate on pages 94 and 95 in the appendix of your participant manual. Chapter 19 was the last portion of the FTA to be agreed upon and it remains essential to the overall balance of concessions that upholds the agreement. NAFTA Chapter 19 is almost identical to FTA Chapter 19. So Mexico has committed to the same rules as Canada and the United States. Chapter 19 covers two types of trade remedy actions, the imposition of anti-dumping duties and countervailing duties. Dumping is generally regarded to be the sale of an exported product at a price lower than that charged for the same or a like product in the home market of the exporter. This practice is regarded globally as a form of unfair price discrimination that was formerly referred to as sales at less than fair value, but now under the new World Trade Organization agreements, this will be called sales at less than the normal value. Anti-dumping duties offset the price difference of the home and exported goods and when exports materially injure domestic companies or industries. Switching gears, subsidies lower a producer's costs or increase its revenues, which may result in lower prices than the producer's competitors. Countervailing duties are permitted under the international rules of the World Trade Organization to offset subsidies that distort international trade flows and materially injure domestic companies or industries. Under Chapter 19, the governments agreed to retain existing national trade remedy laws and procedures, but they also agreed that final agency decisions under those laws could be reviewed by independent binational panels rather than by the national courts. The intention was that the panel process would be more efficient, speedier, cost less, and lead to better reasoned decisions than under the existing trade laws. The application of a private right of action under a trade agreement. So private companies are given the right to appeal government findings to panels of non-government experts is a unique experiment found only in the NAFTA and the FTA. What have been the results? Well, 49 cases were appealed under Chapter 19 of the FDA, and 22 have been initiated under NAFTA Chapter 19. In general, the industries affected are the most sensitive in each domestic market, such as lumber, steel, pork and swine, and cement in the U.S. In Mexico, steel is one of the primary areas for dumping decisions. In Canada, beer, steel, sugar, 
and carpeting have been important sectors covered by these laws. The benefits of this unique Chapter 19 system for review of anti-dumping and countervailing duty determinations include more rapid review than is typical in U.S. or Canadian courts and more certainty of results. In U.S. and Canadian court proceedings, the court decision may be appealed to an appellate court after months or even years of litigation, prolonging the period by, for which deposits of customs duties are collected and held. In Mexico, little, if any, judicial review was available before the system was established. Most panels have completed action in less than two years, including all actions on remand by the administering agencies, and appeals can be made only to extraordinary challenge committees at the request of one of the parties, that is, one of the governments in the agreement, not one of the participants in the litigation itself. This is a significant improvement in the efficiency and speed of dispute settlement. It has also been argued that binational panels of five experts will frequently bring broad experience and working knowledge of the domestic trade laws to the process, which should result in high quality decisions based solidly upon the domestic law applied to the proceeding. Binational panels are composed of five experts drawn from a roster of over 75 potential panelists. Candidates for panels are lawyers, sitting or retired judges, former government officials, noted academics, and others with special expertise in trade dispute settlement or international affairs. Roster members must be of good character, high standing and repute, and shall be chosen strictly on the basis of objectivity, reliability, sound judgment, and general familiarity with international trade law. Candidates will not be affiliated with any government, nor take instructions from any government. A majority of members of each panel must be lawyers in good standing in their respective country. The involved governments must agree upon the final composition of the panel within 55 days of the filing of the request. The panelists themselves appoint the chairman. The legisla legislation implementing the NAFTA outlines very tight deadlines for Chapter 19 panel reviews. A 315-day guideline is established for the filing of the various documents, including detailed arguments on all issues that are called briefs in the United States. The rules also provide for an oral argument before the panel and the issuance of a panel decision. Detailed guidance for the conduct of these panel reviews is provided in the Article 1904 panel rules. The standard of review to be used is critical to the outcome in each country. The standard of review is the, the lens that the panel looks through to see whether the decision is properly made under each country's domestic law. In the U.S., it requires agencies to support their findings with substantial evidence on the record and to make their rulings in accordance with law. In Canada, agencies must comply with the principles of fair play and natural justice. In Mexico, Article 238 of the Fiscal Code governs how the panel is to look at its decision. It's the law. The panel may either uphold a final determination or send it back, which is called a remand, to the investigating authority as you can see on pages 102 and 103 of your participant manual. The agency is then required to report back to the panel by a specific date, and that new fan finding may be challenged by any participant who files a written submission within 20 days of the filing of the determination on remand. If no participants challenge the determination on remand, the panel will affirm the investigating authority's final determination. Where a determination on remand is challenged, the panel will issue a written decision either affirming that determination or remanding it again to the investigating authority. When a panel either dismisses or affirms a determination, the panel will issue a notice of final panel action followed 31 days later by a notice of completion of panel review. The decision of the review panel is final and binding on the involved governments with respect to that particular matter. That's before the panel. 
the decision may not be appealed to domestic courts. I'd like to review one uh, such matter to give you a flavor uh, for how the system works. It involves live swine from Canada. On March 30, 1994, several Canadian producers of swine appealed the Department of Commerce countervailing duty determination involving live swine from Canada. This appeal was from the sixth administra annual administrative review of the countervailing duty order, and it was the third panel to deal with this product. The panel was formed on June 29, 1994, and a hearing was held on February 27, 1995. The panel issued its decision on May 30, 1995, unanimously affirming most of the term determination and remanding part of it back to Commerce to recalculate subclass rates for weanlings and sows and boars. On August 14, 1995, Commerce responded back and gave a company rate for weanlings and amended its order again on September 1, 1995 to find de minimis subsidies for the sows and boars subclass. The panel then affirmed Commerce in an order issued on September 27, 1995 followed by the notice of final panel action on October 10 and a notice of completion on November 13, 1995. The entire proceeding took about 18 months, including the time for the agency to deal with the remand from the panel. This is much faster than is possible in U.S. courts, highlighting two of the most important benefits of this process to businesses, that is, speed and finality, both. I would like to now speak briefly about the appeal process. As a safeguard against impropriety or gross panel error that could threaten the integrity of the panel process, Article 1904 also provides for an extraordinary challenge procedure. When a government to the party to the agreement alleges certain extraordinary improprieties or irregularities, then the aggrieved government may appeal a panel's decision to a three-member committee of judges or former judges from both of the uh, involved countries. The committee must make its decision whether to affirm the panel's decision, remand, that is, send it back to the panel for further action, or vacate it, that is, strike down the panel and its decision, typically within 90 days of its establishment. Uh, decisions of extraordinary challenge committees cannot be appealed to any other judicial or government bodies. I would like to note that no appeal can be made by private participants to an extraordinary challenge committee. There are several other dispute settlement mechanisms provided for in the NAFTA that deserve at least a, a passing comment here. You can find further detail on these on pages 104 and 105 of the appendix. The most important is a mechanism for the settle settlement of investment disputes between a government and an investor of another government under Chapter 11. Such claims may be submitted to arbitration under the International Convention for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, that is, ICSID, or the UNCITRAL arbitration rules. In addition, Chapter 5 provides for the review and appeal of determinations of origin and advanced customs rule rulings by administrative officials of at least one level above the customs official making the ruling or determination, which could be followed by review of the administrative appeal under the domestic law of the importing party. Concerning government procurement, contract awards are now subject to a bid challenge procedure, but not to Chapter 20 panel review. The NAFTA does not permit the review by dispute settlement panels of individual determinations relating to temporary ent entry for business persons when these are made by the appropriate authorities under Chapter 16. I'd now like to shift to a new area that is environmental disputes. The North American Agreement on Environmental Cooperation, established in Article 8, the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, which is comprised of a council, a secretariat, which is located in Montreal, Canada, 
in a joint public advisory committee. Environmental disputes in very limited circumstances may be addressed through consultations between the governments. Some provision is made for private sector input as well. Provision is made for panels of experts to review domestic enforcement of environmental laws and to provide reports to the governments concerning their compliance. In addition, there is a labor agreement, the, labor, the North American Agreement on Labor Cooperation, which established the Commission for Labor Cooperation. Uh, this involves a ministerial council, a secretariat, which is located in Dallas, Texas. Uh, limited dispute settlement functions are provided for in the agreement. I'd like to now look a little more broadly at the application of NAFTA to Latin America. Leaders from all of Latin America agreed at the Miami summit in December of 1994 to form the Free Trade Area of the Americas, also known in the states as the FTAA, by the year 2005. This process is moving ahead, despite press reports and skeptics' comments that the FTAA process is moribund. The recent ministerial in Cartagena, Colombia, not only established four additional working groups to join the initial seven, but also resulted in agreement to consider recommendations at the 1997 ministerial meeting in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, on when and how to launch formal FTAA negotiations. We also agreed on a number of areas for immediate action or business facilitation measures in line with the ministerial pledge to achieve concrete progress by the end of this century toward attainment of the FTA finally in 2005. One of the new working groups will consider dispute settlement mechanisms in the new hemispheric free trade arrangement. What's perhaps equally significant is the fact that the Cartagena Ministerial established definitively the involvement of the private sector in the creation of the FTAA, deciding that ministers and the private sector should continue to meet together annually to make the FTAA a reality. Today I have outlined several complicated mechanisms for the international conflict management. The world is rapidly becoming a smaller place with virtually instantaneous communication of any information anywhere. With the expansion of trade that is inevitably happening, it is crucial that well-developed, reliable, and efficient methods for settling conflicts are put in place so that international businesses can prosper and take full advantage of the new opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Holbein. Let us begin now with our second question and answer session. Our first question is a fax. It's from Sanyo in Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. The question is, how can equitable treaties or agreements be reached when there are wide differences in the economic power or influence between the parties? Mr. Holbein? Well, uh, I believe that there are uh, several ways that that can be addressed. Uh, certainly in the uh, World Trade Organization, there is uh, a new global uh, in, uh, trade arrangement and new rules that apply across the board. Uh, you, it's interesting to note that the first dispute that has gone through the new dispute settlement process uh, involves um, a dispute between the United States and Venezuela, which uh, Venezuela won both at the panel and also at the, the appellate body process. And I think there is significant proof there that, in fact, a smaller country can uh, win if uh, under the rules of this new global arrangement. Also, uh, as we move forward into the FTAA, the Free Trade Agreement uh, of the Americas, uh, you will find that it's also possible for countries to aggregate, such as you're seeing in Mercosur and the uh, Andean Pact and other uh, economic arrangements and integration processes through Central America and the Caribbean as well. And that process can enhance the economic leverage uh, each of the smaller countries has in negotiating with its neighbors and, of course, with the others uh, in NAFTA. Thank you. Our next question is live from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, Universidad Hispanoamericana, 
en Coacalco, Estado de México. De acuerdo a sus de vista, According to your viewpoints, for the future, do you think, well, you seem to think that there will be like three economic powers, America, Europe, and the Orient. Well, when we say America, we mean the U.S. or the, the, whole, the Americas. What will happen to countries that don't have that many resources? Will the conflicts be resolved? Trade or business conflicts be resolved by zones, do you think? Mr. Holbein? Uh, I don't I don't believe that that is uh, necessarily the, uh, the, the way or the uh, process through which um, the globalization of the economy will occur. Um, I have neglected or failed to mention that there is also already in place an APEC process where the Asia-Pacific uh, region is, all of the countries in that area are trying to negotiate a broadening and deepening of uh, economic liberalization and trade liberalization throughout Asia and the Americas. There is certainly a, an ongoing dialogue between the Americas and the European community, and I know several of the uh, countries in Latin America are negotiating uh, liberalized free trading arrangements with the European community. Uh, in addition, uh, as, uh, Africa has undertaken a number of integration steps and uh, they have in place several uh, organizations to help with uh, their improving their economic situation and those blocks will eventually help to further broaden and improve their multilateral situation so I think that over time it will evolve to everyone's benefit our next question is live it's from KTV Comunicaciones LTDA Sao Paulo Brazil Buenas tardes. What are the first formal steps that will be taken in order to establish the dispute resolution mechanisms in the NAFTA that will uh, include all of us in the Americas, North, uh, Central, and South Americans? Mr. Holbein? Well, as I mentioned in my uh, talk, there is this um, process moving forward to a, for a free trade agreement of the Americas, and I believe that the work of this new working group on dispute settlement and the ongoing sets of ministerials, the uh, Im uh, importance of having the business community in each country providing input both into the working groups and also into each government uh, will certainly ensure that as we move toward 2005 and the um, finalization of this free trade area uh, of the America's arrangement that all of these dispute settlement mechanisms will be taken into account the business community's needs and government needs will, will be taken care of uh, toward over the next decade in that process Thank you. our next question is again live it's from la Comisión Federal de Electricidad en el Auditorio Atoyac, México, Distrito Federal Good morning. Who is the arbiter when we have an ex a special uh, conflict? Um, jury? Don't we have a problem that if the judge is also a party to the matter, in other words, if the, the tribunal is in the country where that is also a party to the matter of the conflict? I'm not sure I understand the question. I am not, no estamos seguros. The question is, has to do with if, if the United States is a judge and how can it be a party to the conflict? How can you have a, an American company and a Mexican company under conflict and trying to resolve the conflict? And the United States is the, the place where the, the, the jury or the tribunal is. Let, let me begin to answer that, answer that question. Um, if it is between two companies that the uh, arbitration begins, each of the various sets of rules that exist that are promulgated by the international institutions that offer arbitration services will govern the choice of arbitrators. Uh, there may be specific provisions in NAFTA when a, between governments there are issues uh, having to do with contract interpretation that require the appointment of certain arbitrators. For instance, in the international business context, the primary source of rules 
is uh, from the United Nations. It is a, uh, a model law and set of rules called UNCITRAL. Um, UNCITRAL usually says that the arbitrator will not be a nation, uh, national or citizen of the country of either of the two uh, people involved in the dispute. Therefore, if we had a dispute between a U.S. company and a Mexican company, ordinarily the arbitrator would be a national of some other country. It could be Canada, it could be Venezuela, it could be England or France. The parties can waive that if they both trust someone who, for instance, is a Mexican national, but ordinarily the rule is that the arbitrator should not be of the same nationality as uh, either of the two parties, at least under the United Nations law. Okay, our next call is from Panama. Muy buenos días. Buenos días. La pregunta es, the question is, Lay Borton has been denounced under the NAFTA. What is your opinion about this politically sensitive problem that is violating free trade laws or standards and until what extent can incentives to one activity can be actually considered a subsidy? You just mentioned. Mr. Holbein? Yes, I'm not sure I, I understood the, the full uh, um, question, but there are two things I would say about subsidies. Uh, first, while subsidies have not been specifically addressed uh, in NAFTA, um, there is a new global context uh, and there is a new understanding involving subsidies and uh, countervailing measures under the World Trade Organization agreements that have been put in place. And uh, certainly all three members of NAFTA, the United States, Mexico, and Canada, are signatories to that new basis on a global basis of what is considered subsidization and how it is to be dealt with. So each is conforming its laws with the new global rules. Those global rules will be applied in NAFTA, in the free trade area, among the three countries. And it is on that basis that each country then has a common ground to prepare its law and apply its law to goods not just of Canada and Mexico in the United States context, but also that's the common ground with which the United States will deal with the world. Our next question is live. It is from La Universidad Central de Venezuela in Caracas, Venezuela. Buenos días. Two questions. First of all, how can you adapt the NAFTA interest and the free trade zone for the year 2000. Second question would be the existence of some of the precedents of disputes within the NAFTA and in what areas. Uh, Mr. Holbein, uh, what areas within NAFTA do you, do you see the disputes arising? Well, our experience has been that disputes are arising in those uh, industries and sectors that are most economically or politically sensitive or where the rules are not sufficiently well defined necessarily and so they have tended to be those areas where there are large government subsidy programs uh, where there are um, conditions of competition are not as uh, well, how shall I say the profit margins etc are not so good for some of them uh, they have been for example steel uh, softwood lumber has been a big problem, uh, cement, um, a number of other uh, products as well, and certainly agricultural and fisheries products has, uh, continue to present unique issues for res resolution of disputes. I would project that that sort of thing will continue as we progress, but each country as they enter into the NAFTA process or the FTAA process uh, will have a unique set of economic problems or economically sensitive sectors that may or may not cause problems as they negotiate through and enter into the uh, agreements. Our next question is from Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, in the United States of America. Hmm? As always. Um, good afternoon. I would like to know how other trade agreements, just, um, that such as Mercosur, deal with conflict resolutions. Um, how are they? similar or different from the conflict resolutions of NAFTA? Mr. Holbein? That's a, a good question because I've mentioned previously some of the integration efforts in uh, the hemisphere 
And uh, it is my understanding, based on where we are currently with Mercosur, that they do not have as um, detailed a process and date and time specific a process as we have evolved in NAFTA. NAFTA. However, I think the underpinnings, that is a consultation process and a set of mechanisms and organizations where the governments and countries involved, and to a, a lesser extent the business community, can provide input so that the governments and uh, officials talk to each other and try to resolve disputes in a collaborative framework such as Mary has been discussing rather than in a confrontational way which so often leads to, to failure of